been southbound, I've been hellbound, riding on the midnight train. Going too fast now, think I ought to slow down, standing in the pouring rain. What's going on, guys? Tony and Tristan here with the Zero Duck 30 podcast. Uh, today we have on Travis Thompson, and all of my Florida and probably Southern Marsh duck hunters are going to be familiar with that name. Um, Travis has done a lot of conservation work for um, not only Florida, but I think a lot of the South. And uh, Delta was um, actually just honored him at their uh, Delta Waterfowl Convention with the Legacy um, Conservation Award, I believe is what Travis said it was called. But we're super excited to have him on. He has his organization, allflorida.org, and um, you know he's a longtime waterfowler. And Travis, why don't you kind of give everybody a little bit of your background and how you got into waterfowling, man, and conservation? Yeah. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me, fellas. I appreciate y'all having me on. Yes, um, sir. Long time listener, first time talker. How about that? Because <laughs> I know you guys, you guys had our buddy uh, Alex Pomerado on a few weeks back, and I listened yes, to, I listened to that. Alex is a, he's one of the awesome. He's just an awesome dude. But <laughs> so fair. I'm a, uh, I'm a fifth generation Floridian. Um, had my captain's license since 2005. Used to guide just for saltwater fishing. I uh, grew up hunting and fishing, you know, whatever was in season, we were hunting, whatever was biting, we were fishing for, um, and kind of over time just, just grew into my love of waterfowl hunting. It, it, when I first got heavy into it, it required way less scouting than deer hunting did, and I was able to talk. Mm-hmm. So duck hunting had a lot more appeal because you could sit there and didn't have to be quiet. Mm-hmm. Um but uh, just just grew up kind of doing it all. Uh, like I said, fifth generation Floridian. My family, you know, growing up, we didn't have a lot of money. We went on vacation. We hunted and fished in Florida. That's what we did for vacation. <laughs> awesome. So uh, just kind of came by it natural. Grew up. <clears throat> my dad worked for Florida DEP for almost 50 years. Wow. So I kind of grew up in a family where we looked at things through a lens of conservation. Um, and you know, one, one thing led to another. So I've been, I've been a full-time guide now for about seven years. Mm-hmm. I still do a little bit of fishing stuff. Um, not nearly as much as I used to because I focus so heavily on ducks now, but, um, from September to the end of January, I won't pick up a fishing pole. Everything I do will be focused on waterfowl and waterfowl honey. So That's awesome. uh, uh, full, full bore all the time. That's awesome, man. And how long have you, um, well, first of all, fishing and, um, fishing and, you know, waterfowl kind of lend together cause you're out there fishing and you can't help, but be, you're basically scouting at the same time, you know, especially running up in creeks and stuff, trying to get into redfish and stuff or whatever. <laughs> but, um, you got that right. But when did you, uh, get into waterfowl? How long have you been doing that? Man, I've been duck hunting my entire life, but I would not say I was a duck hunter until I was in my early twenties, I worked with a guy and we would apply for quota permits over at TM Goodwin and Broadmoor. Mm -hmm. And we both worked in it at the time. And so we would, we would get, you know, eight, 10, 12 permits a season because they all came out at like 10 o'clock on some Tuesday and we would have like multiple computers logged in. And (laughs) we really, we gained the system back then. And so I was able to hunt what at the time was probably the premier hunt in the southeastern United States. Mm-hmm. And I was able to hunt it, you know, the season's 10 weeks long. You could hunt it twice a week, Tuesdays and Saturdays through a quota. Between the two of us, we would get, you know, eight to 10 quotas. And if my dad pulled one or, or my podcast co-host, his, his dad, um, Nate was too young, but his dad would pull one. You know, I got to hunt over there a lot in some really high quality stuff. And that's really when I became kind of into duck hunting because that was, that was the, uh, didn't have a deer lease, didn't have a turkey lease. So, you know, you, you'd apply for quotas and stuff, but it could get discouraging. Mm-hmm. Waterfowl hunting, you can do it on public land, you can do it on public water. There's a lot of public water around. So again, I've never, I've never had a mountain of money to sit on top of, um, it was it was kind of nice to me as an opportunity. I could just go on a Saturday morning and hunt. Mm-hmm. I could just go on a Tuesday morning and hunt. So um, that's really, I guess, probably my early twenties is when we really got into that. I couldn't tell you the exact year, but I had killed ducks before that. I had duck hunted before that, but we were always, like I said, we we were always kind of like opportunistic hunters. So mm-hmm. if if 
the ringnecks were in heavy on Kissimmee and my uncle knew where they were, we were going duck hunting that Saturday. <laughs> right. But if the specs were biting on this topoga, we weren't going duck hunting. We were going spec fishing. Like it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't uh, what we were married to. Right. Right now. So Travis, one of the other things that you do uh, also is you, I understand you run the number one outdoor um, podcast in the state of Florida. Yeah. So we, we have cast and blast Florida. Um, I think this is year five of that podcast. And I do that with, um, a good friend of mine, Nathan Henderson, my dad, and his dad were best friends. So he kind of grew up as my, as my, uh, little brother I never had. And then my wife is the third co-host there, Emily. Um, she's probably the most beloved co-host, <laughs> but we, uh, we started that because at the time there was no one doing podcasts really in Southeast, the Southeastern United States, focusing on hunting and fishing and no one specifically in Florida. Mm -hmm. And, um, really we, we started it because it was fun. It sounded like a fun thing to do. And over the years, it's really turned into a unique community. It's turned into a, a cool kind of, um, we call it a entry point for people to talk about conservation, talk about hunting, talk about fishing, you know, we've run, we, so, so between the three things you know, I've got the podcast, I've got the nonprofit, all Florida, all FLA.org. And I've got, um, my guide services. Mm -hmm. I kind of use all of them interchangeably to try to move people towards conservation. Like that's at the end of the day, my goal is if I can create more conservationists, all the other stuff's going to take care of itself. For sure. Yep. And so, um, the podcast, you know, there's weeks where we will joke around and pick on each other and talk about what's your favorite song when you're driving to the boat ramp in the morning. <laughs> and then there's other weeks when we will tackle, you know, <clears throat> HR 8167 and the, and the Pittman Robertson impacts and the funding, the way funding works. And we just, we try to talk about stuff that matters to us in ways that we'd like to listen to it. Sure. Um, and we're not always successful. You guys have probably learned that you're not always successful, but you just keep trying You get up every, every day and do it over again. Yep. That's right. And the beautiful thing is you can listen back and say, well, you know, I, I don't like that. I said that, or, you know, I wish I would have done this a little different, which is kind of nice. Yep. In our, in our earliest episode, we had one microphone. Mm -hmm. And we would swing it back and forth to each other. Nice. <laughs> and so, and so, if you went back and listened, like I don't even know how you could find them. They're out there somewhere. But you, if you went back and like listened to episode two or three, it's like, and Nate, next up, we're going to be talking about Roland Martin fishing, and I, I'm going to throw it over to you. And then I would literally <laughs> throw the mic over to him, and it was so bad. But it, like, you just you, you just keep doing it, man. You just keep doing it, and you learn over time. You know, you missed a, a grand opportunity there, Travis. You guys could have been say could had dubbed in some uh, some teal flying by, and you could have been like, "Dude, did you see how fast those swing the mic over yeah. to him? teal?" Yeah, flew by. <laughs> <laughs> had the had the wind as it goes by. Yeah. Oh, so bad. But you know, you guys are podcasters. Sometimes we wouldn't be the right distance from the mic. Mm -hmm. You you'd swing it over and like you'd forget to talk into it. I mean, it was just a comedy of errors. Yeah. Um, we, we launched the podcast and a week later, Irma hit and we couldn't press publish for two weeks because we didn't have power. Oh no. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, it was just like everything that could go wrong went wrong over the years, but it's, that's how you learn is just keep doing it. <laughs> wow. Wow. For sure, man. It's, it's a fun thing. It's uh it's kind of crazy. We've been doing it for a little over four months now. So this is, you're going to be our 20th episode and it's crazy how fast time flies. But um, you know, just, I was thinking on the way here, the opportunities, I, like I feel like I've became a better speaker in general in my personal life life just from like podcasting you know right. <laughs> which is kind of 100 100 percent. like you just get used to talking mm -hmm. and and forming coherent thoughts quickly for sure yeah and you'll, you'll watch a podcast and, and or listen to it and you'll be like if i say that one word one more time in a row yeah <laughs> i'm gonna do a backflip out of this chair right now <laughs> I mean, it's just, you got that right you just but you know as they say you're you're your biggest uh you're 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 critic. The, you're your biggest critic. Yep. For yep. Sure. Your own worst critic. For sure. Well, uh, we're excited to get into some of this conservation stuff, Travis. Um, really, kind of what spawned this. Uh, you know, obviously, like we're parts of D, you know DU and um, conservation's on any duck hunter's mind, really. But 
talking to Ramsey Russell is really kind of what got me and Tony's, um, you know, mind spinning. And also, you've probably heard of that Wings Over Waterfowl movie that that Chris Dorsey's putting out. Yeah. Um, so those two things really kind of got us thinking, man, we all really have to step up as duck hunters. And if you have a platform, you really need to be talking about it. Um, and, you know, we obviously being from, we're not originally from Florida, but we lived in Jacksonville for uh, nine years and got into duck hunting um, in Florida, obviously. So Florida, we still spend a lot of time there and it's kind of heavy on our uh, minds and hearts as far as duck hunting. So that's why we really wanted to have you on to talk about some of this stuff. Yeah. If, I mean, because, you know, it is one of those things where, you know, we're doing what we're doing in the industry out of our passion, what drives us and makes us get up every day. But, you know, I kind of related to back when I was in the military, you know, there's, there's folks that have all kinds of functions in the military, right? You got your, you got your commanders, you got your, your officers, you have your enlisted, you know, and everybody serves a vital piece to make the machine go. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, it just kind of made me that I've got, made me realize that I have a lot more to learn about this industry and, and, and the sport that we love and the animals that we go after, you know, and people like you, quite frankly, humble the hell out of me. I mean, I, I mean, it does. Anytime I see somebody that just boots on the ground is out there doing, I mean, I went through your stuff, Travis, it it blew my mind, man. I mean, you're everywhere, dude. (laughs) (laughs) I I appreciate that, man. We, we try hard. It's, you know, I think, and I don't know if you have a jumping off point into this, but I think there's a there's a struggle between we want to hunt. Our partners at HuntWise are offering an exclusive discount for Zero Duck 30 followers. As an elite member, some of the features you'll immediately gain access to are HuntCast, WindCast, peak kill times, property lines, owner information, and phone lookup. 250 map layers, unlimited offline maps, 3D maps, social media, and on top of it all, save up to 50% off some of the top hunting brands in the industry. Download and explore the number one hunting tool set today and save 20% by using code DUCK30. Like, at our base, what I want to do is every morning of duck season, I want to get up and go kill six ducks. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if I got three buddies with me, I want to go kill 24 ducks. I want, and I want to pick out the drakes and I want them all to be full plumed and I want them all to be banded. <laughs> like I, I want it, I want it to take four hours, but I really want it to be over in about seven minutes because we got so many <laughs> birds dumping in. Like we all have this kind of idealistic dream of what we want to do. And that's why we hunt. Like that's the thing that makes us get up. Like let's make no bones about it. The, mm-hmm. the idea is, we measure success in, did we, did we kill anything? Did we kill our limit? Did you kill a trophy? Like we have these layers of success that we look through, mm-hmm. but frankly, um, there's a, there's a, a little bit of disconnect there in that if we're only worried about going to the woods and shooting our ducks, if we're not worried about the conservation side of the street, mm-hmm. This thing we care very deeply about, it'll probably be around, you know, I'm 45 years old. It's going to be around the next 25 years, right? It's not going away that soon. Mm -hmm. But if we think that's not that long, yeah, like it it could generationally begin to fade and that's already starting to happen. It's already being threatened at a major, major level, particularly in Florida. So my, my friend Matt Pierce, he's a rancher. He, he's past president of Florida Cattlemen's Association. Mm-hmm. You know, ranching has gotten demonized in conservation circles in Florida over the years. And he said for a long time, what ranchers wanted to do is they wanted to close the gate and they wanted to work their cattle. Mm-hmm. And then they, you know, they went to church with their community on Sunday and they had dinner with their family on Saturday. And they, but they, they focused really on what happened inside the gate. Yeah. Until we open the gate and invite people in to see what ranching is about, how it works, what they actually do for the land, the benefits, the water management, the the actual lack of fertilizer they use, the inputs. The, until they do that, they can't change that story. Right. It's the exact same thing with hunters. 
we are predisposed to want to go to the woods and chase our ducks, chase our turkey, shoot our deer and kind of be left alone. But the time is now that we can no longer do that. We have to, have to, have to engage in conservation and kind of be better stewards of our pastime, not just of our woods and waters, but of our pastime as a whole. Um, And if we don't do that, we are in big trouble. Man, what a great analogy and Mm -hmm. um, way you kind of said that, Travis. Um, and that's, that's kind of something that just hit me and Tony on a whole different level. Like I was saying here in the last month or so, um, obviously when you're duck hunting, you're part of DU and Delta and these other things, but, um, we're looking at it like, man, we really want to get boots on the ground and do whatever we can, you know? Yeah, no, we, uh, we've already committed to doing some things for the youth season, um, with, um, with Mario and a couple of other people and stuff that we're going to get down there and. And we're going to be filming a, a youth hunt, you know, I want, I, want, I want these kids to see them shoot some stuff and have some fun. You know, I want them to see themselves and be able to brag to all their other friends about it. So they'll tell 10 other people about, oh, I saw Tim on their smoke a duck. He tells 10 <laughs> kids and whatever it was, or, you know, that they gave him a free shirt or, you know, all that stuff. And man, I, I don't even, um, it, it just again, I I just want to listen because I I'm just it, it's still I'm just like a a robot right now just just all ears. Well, Travis, what are some of the things that um you know all Florida? Well, first of all, when did all Florida start? Um, and when or what are some of the things that all Florida is doing um for the conservation efforts in Florida? So all Florida is still starting, so to speak. I mean, we've got we've got hundred plus members at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I like to, I like to say it this way. We have, we have a problem in Florida in that we have sportsman's groups and we have environmental groups and we don't have anything that in my mind behaves truly as a conservation group. Mm-hmm. So CCA Florida, great organization, good friends of mine. I trust CCA in Florida. They do really good fisheries work. They focus on fisheries. So when you have a conversation around like a lake management plan and how maybe managing this fish over here has a correlation to, so, so like Jewfish, um, Goliath grouper, we want to close down. There was a big pushback to keep that closed, even though IUCN said that the species are recovered. We want to open them for a limited harvest. We pushed FWC to open for a limited harvest on Goliath grouper. They followed the science on that. Well, that sounds exactly like the scenario in Florida with bears, hmm. but CCA Florida is a fisheries organization. They can't make that connection. They can't draw those parallels and they can't put together a contingent to then go advocate to, Hey, if we can open Goliath group or why can't we open bears? Right. Hmm. It's Good the point. same organization. So the goal with all Florida, I believe conservation includes honey. Mm-hmm. I believe a lot of times we look at that the other way around. We say hunting is conservation. That's not true the way it used to be. But I think true conservation includes hunting and fishing. Mm-hmm. So I view all Florida as a true conservation organization, meaning there are some environmental groups out there that are anti-hunting. Well, I don't view what they're doing as real conservation because they don't view all aspects of the resource the same way I do. Conservation is the idea of We want to seek the proper use of a resource. Mm -hmm. Preservation is we want to keep a resource from being used. So I'm not going to pick on one, but, but, um, center for biological diversity, I'll pick on them because I don't love them. (laughs) CBD doesn't want anyone to hunt. They want to block hunting. That's a preservationist mentality. It has nothing to do with conservation. On the flip side, on the flip side, we have lots of hunting groups out there that are worried about can we have a bear hunt? Can we have a deer season? Can we get more quota tags? All of those are really good things. I'm on board with all of those things, but no one's looking at the whole board, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And what we are trying to do with all Florida is look at the whole board. So, you know, we've got legislation out there that was passed for the Florida wildlife corridor act. And so governor DeSantis has appointed commissioners and this is one of his pet deals is the wildlife corridor 
Well, all the people making decisions around it, none of them are hunters. None of them are sportsmen. Mm -hmm. And how do we get a seat in that room and at that table? Well, if we go in there guns blazing and say, well, we want a seat because we're Delta waterfowl or we're whatever, we don't get the seat at the table. Mm -hmm. So we have created all Florida as kind of a broader look at conservation in our state with the idea that hunting is decidedly part of conservation. So it sounds overly simplistic when I put it that way, but that's really how all Florida exists in that landscape. It's not truly a sportsman's organization. We view it, we, we, our tagline right now is authentic conservation because we believe that to do real conservation, hunting should be considered. That's not to say if you guys, you put a 300 acre conservation easement in downtown, you know, Orlando, I'm not going to say you should have hunting on it. Like we don't know the logistics of that. Yeah. but hunting should be considered. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I guess, you know, when you guys look at something like that, um, like you're saying as your base point, really in a nutshell, what you're saying is we're, we're taking first, we're, we're, we're acting on the environment, the environment to make sure that the, the tadpoles feed the ducks and the ducks feed the eagles and the eagles feed the, you know what I mean? The, right. All of that is in place then can it accept hunting can it accept fishing and i kind of see where you're talking about especially when you made that analogy between um the fishing and the bear hunting it's kind of like when you got into the bear part now there's a gap <laughs> spot on and, you know florida i don't want to hang up on bears but florida has more bears than any state in the country without a bear season wow. we're the only state with more than a thousand bears that doesn't have a bear hunt wow. and we have 4,000 bears. Yeah, I was going to say, I thought it was closer to four now. Yeah. No, we, we have we have more bears in Florida today than at any point since white settlers landed on the peninsula. Holy cow. So, so really, our, well, technically since Hernando de Soto, 1513, we have more bears now than we have at any point in history. And we have 21 and a half million people. Right. It's time to have a bear hunt. But political pressure on politicians that are generally considered friendly to hunters or are held up by hunters and overwhelmingly supported by hunters, they have zero interest in moving on this kind of thing because they're going to get crushed in the court of public opinion by the environmental side. Right. So without looking at what I'll call landscape conservation, you know, overwhelmingly in our, in our private hunting group on Facebook, mm -hmm. um, question out there what's the single biggest issue facing hunting conservation fishing in florida in the in the near term i forget how we're exactly let's close overwhelmingly it was land conservation overwhelmingly because we're developing at such a at such a high rate of speed mm -hmm. but if we just conserve land and we don't worry about hunters place on that landscape if we're not actively seeking it we're never going to get it back and without a without a population to push to acquire access to that land, we're never going to get it. So hunters in Florida make up 2% of the population, 1.8%. Mm -hmm. And we gain 1,000 people a day. Even if they hunt where they come from, that doesn't mean they're going to hunt here. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, we, we have this war of attrition going on all the time. And we have to kind of change how we look at the problem. So I'm a strategy guy. We have to we have to change the strategy and how we look at the problem. And what we're doing isn't working. So we need to conserve as much land as we can, to be sure. But we need to be conserving it through the lens of what is conservation. And conservation is seeking the proper use. Mm -hmm. So if we conserve 2,000 acres... Why can't we run turkey hunts on it? Why can't we run alligator hunts on it? Why can't we run small game hunts on it? Like the, the question shouldn't be, why would you? The question should be, why can't you? Right. Yeah. And Travis, there was um, a similar topic brought up on the Dr. Duck Waterfowl podcast with um, them being out in Texas. Uh, they were talking about, you know, when these um, any new WMAs that are established or new areas like you're talking about, like they were saying that there has to be something that says, you know, and it, they're not talking about the whole WMA or the whole land set aside, but 25% of it, 50% of it where people can hunt on it. Um, Cause like you said, once, um, once you don't get it, you're not going to get it back because mm -hmm. of that attrition. It's crazy. 
again, not I'll paint in political stereotypes, but generally, generally speaking, in the southeast, you think Republicans, you think that's the hunting party. Those are the guys that all hunt this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. If you went into like the northeast, and I don't know the state specifically, but like New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, some some states that you would say are fairly liberal leaning, mm -hmm. you can hunt in their state parks. Mm -hmm. In oh, Florida, we can't even cross that. Like that's that's not even a conversation anyone wants to oh, have. Wow, that's so interesting. And you're talking, you're talking three and a half, four million acres of land in Florida. Wow. And I'm not saying I want to I want to turn every hunt state park into a hunting opportunity, but um, for waterfowl we get 69 days a year. For deer, you get I think 122 days a year. Something like, why couldn't you have some special opportunity? hunts on some of those properties like we have all this water management district land up and down the state millions of acres mm -hmm. why is any of that closed off to hunters mm -hmm. like those those are questions that we shouldn't have to fight to get that we have to fight tooth and nail we have no political support for it and until we can build up a team that is willing to kind of be more strategic about how we go about. And I also don't want to be reductive. Like there's guys out there that have fought for years and years and years mm -hmm. to get things open. Like we just got back a hunt in the Panther National Wildlife mm -hmm. Refuge in Southwest Florida. Mm -hmm. So that was a special opportunity turkey hunt that this year was the first time in 30 some odd years anyone's hunted in that property. Wow. That's a big win. Yeah. Heck yeah. And I don't want to be reductive to it, but it's also not a lot of opportunities. Mm -hmm. Like in the grand scheme of things, what is it? 30 quota permits, 22 quota permits. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm not knocking it, but we've got to make 10 of those happen here. We deserve more than a bone. For sure. Yeah. And that's, that's again, I don't want to knock it because that took blood, sweat and tears from guys like Mike Elfenbein and, and some of that crew. Like they poured their heart and soul into reopening that for a long time and fought day after day after day for it. So it's a big deal, but we need more and we need a lot more. You know, we can't, we can't market and recruit more hunters because where are we going to put them? Right. Mm -hmm. But we don't have enough hunters to have a sustainable hunter population that's representative. Mm -hmm. So are we just in this death spiral or how do we fix that? Right. I think the way to fix it is we got to get more opportunities. We got to get more access and we need to be marketing to recruit more hunters. Mm -hmm. Travis, let me ask you this, and this might be a dumb question, but I, I just, something that Tony was saying, um, he mentioned, you know, Illinois is a state where you can hunt their state parks and that's where we're originally from and we're big bow hunters and stuff. But, um, you know, with Florida being such a state that, uh, taxpayer dollars are, you know, it's such a, um, tourist driven state. Is it one of those one of those things versus like Illinois that has um, a lot of their, I mean, hunters are a big chunk of income coming to the state of Illinois, so they might be a little bit more inclined to let people hunt those state parks and you know move on some of these things for hunters. But um, a state like Florida that gets so much tax revenue from you know all these out of staters coming in from Disney and all these other places, the beaches and stuff. Is it one of those things that that's another battle affecting Florida hunting or is there not a correlation? Yeah, you said it perfectly. I'll say it with more words. Okay. The, the, <laughs> the <laughs> hunting, hunting exists for a couple of reasons. You either have a right to hunt and fish, which some states do, or hunting is viewed as a viable management tool by whatever conservation agency is in charge of your state. So you have too many deer, you have whatever, and you can generate revenue off of selling deer tags and people can hunt them. And so it, it keeps it in check. It's a revenue generator for the state. Like those are the reasons hunting exists. Mm -hmm. uh, not historically, like historically hunting exists so you can get food, mm -hmm. but in 2022, that's why hunting exists. So, if you look at a state like Florida, most state wildlife agencies are largely funded through license sales, both hunting and fishing. Mm -hmm. You you pay in Florida, I think your hunting license, let's say it's 18, 20 bucks a year. I don't know. I get one of those packaged things, so I don't know what it is individually, <laughs> but I think it's 18, 1850 a year mm -hmm. for a hunting license. That money goes into a fund for the state. 
As waterfowlers, we experience all kinds of extreme weather conditions. Stay bone dry and warm with Frog Togs hunting gear. You can check them out at frogtogs.com or at Frog Togs Hunt on Instagram. Then you've heard of the Pittman Robertson tax, which is an excise tax on guns and ammo and archery equipment. That money gets paid by the manufacturer into a fund at U.S. Fish and Wildlife and then gets apportioned out to the states based off, among other things, the number of hunting licenses sold. Okay. So in Florida, we have 220,000, 240,000 hunters. We get X number of dollars back per hunter from the feds. Mm -hmm. So that's the old term, hunters pay for conservation. Mm. In most states, that's enough to fund the wildlife agency. In Florida, when FWC was formed, so before it was FWC, it was Game and Fish Commission, GFC, mm -hmm. and that was back in the 90s, 80s, 90s. Um, it was largely funded through hunting and fishing licenses. We changed that and we created a dock stamp that goes onto the sale of every house. Okay. And that dock stamp goes into a state fund that helps fund FWC. Oh, okay. Then we also created a gas tax. There's a state gas tax. So all those 130 million tours that come to Florida, uh -huh. they have a rental car, they're paying for Ubers, they're, there's a gas tax on that that goes to help pay for FWC. That's awesome. So FWC's annual budget this year was around $450, $460 million. Mm -hmm. Hunting license sales was worth $7.4 million. Oh, wow. Holy cow. <laughs> so juxtapose that with a state, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I want to say for a state like Mississippi, uh -huh. their state wildlife agency budget, don't hold me to this, but it was something like $95 million, and $75 million of that came from hunter numbers, hunter and fisher numbers. Wow. Like, so we're already – very insignificant in the grand scheme of things in Florida mm -hmm. as far as what our dollar contributes. Right. And Florida doesn't have a right to hunt and fish. So why keep us around if all we're doing is paying to keep the lights on for the hunting and game management division and the governor's going to get a headache if he turns a bear hunt on because all the anti-hunters and Heck, a lot of people that aren't anti-hunting, they just don't like the optics of a dead bear, right. are going to call the governor's office and blow them up. It becomes this really tedious problem. So in a state like Illinois, where you have huge funding coming from license sales and federal dollars coming back to the state, mm -hmm. yeah, they're going to be okay with opening hunting because it's a revenue stream. Yeah. In Florida, it's such an insignificant revenue stream, although I would make the argument – me, Travis, I'm a homeowner. I, I drive a car around, so I'm paying gas taxes. I'm paying uh, uh, real estate taxes and everything else. But I'm also paying fees on top of that to hunt and fish. I would like to see those dock stamps, those gas taxes be used not just to manage non-game stuff, but also to manage game stuff. Like some percentage of that should also come over to the hunting side of the house. Right. And I think we'd see that budget swell a little bit and we could see more marketing, more recruitment going on. For sure. Tra Travis, how much, how often, cause you know, I'm just sitting there, my mind spinning, like you said, from, um, you know, like a fix the problem standpoint, point of view, how often, if any, do you guys like, I could see waterfowl resources piggybacking off of the fishing resources which is the number one stream of outdoor revenue in florida um is there a correlation there with uh, money cross-funding you know because uh fishing is is driving the sales and and fishing boats and all that stuff or no mild so so there is there's the habitat argument right um if if money goes to fund let's say gopher tortoises. Um, gopher tortoise, if your listeners aren't familiar, is a terrestrial turtle, it's a tortoise, that lives like in sand pines and uplands. If money goes to fund gopher tortoise restoration and studies and habitat, that's going to benefit bobwhite quail 
It's going to benefit white-tailed deer. It's going to benefit Florida black bear. So there's an ancillary benefit there in that that habitat is also used by game species. Mm -hmm. Um, So we see that some with, we see it from a fishery side with access because, so there's Pittman Robertson on the hunting side, the, the, the kind of similar act on the fishery side is called Dingle Johnson. Then it was called Wallop Bro because those were the names of the senators that promoted it. And now it's called the Sport Fish Restoration Act. That act pays for quite a few boat ramps in Florida. Like huh. most new boat ramps, most boat ramp maintenance, a lot of that comes through sport fish restoration dollars. So as a waterfowl hunter, I benefit from sport fish restoration like even if I wasn't a fisherman, I would benefit from fishing licenses buying those ramps because it's opening the access for me to get on the lake. Right. That's probably the closest correlation where you see some benefit that's ancillary from um, another another division. I gotcha. Um, you know, as far you know, we're talking about conservation and kind of some of the challenges Florida's facing. Facing. What are some exciting things to look at as far as like Florida waterfowl? Um, is there anything that off the top of your head that you're looking at and you're saying, man, that's a great thing for the waterfowl community here. Delta waterfowl showing up in Florida is a great thing. Yeah. I think, I think the thing that I get excited about is we're starting to see, um, how do I say this? Well, we're starting to see less tribalism, Mm -hmm. um, and more teamwork which I think is the only way we have to go forward. For sure. So, um, you know, we uh, personally, like Travis, has partnered with um, Matt Pierce and some of the cattle ranchers to run waterfowl programs on leases that have not been hunted. So oh, we're nice. seeing an increase in opportunity. Like that's that's a big deal. And we've we've pushed really hard to keep the affordability of that low so we could get more people out there because then it also they get to shoot ducks but they also get to see that agriculture is beneficial to florida yeah you know Mm. it's it's keeping houses off the landscape at the bare minimum but in reality you know there's there's best management practices in ag where you can cross fence so you move your cattle around to actually improve water quality as it filters across a pasture because don't think of this as like, you know, your your Kansas pastures or your Oklahoma pastures. These are basically swamps mm-hmm. where these cows, I mean, we call it swimming cattle some days when they got to go get them <laughs> out because you'll be riding a horse and your your boots will be in the water. <laughs> um, so so the, these properties are managed in a way so that they are using the best management practices to also clean water and benefit uh, not just the, the cow, the cows and the rancher. But that's where you see the panthers. That's where you'll see tortoises. That's where you'll see uh, endangered snail kites and caracaras and uh, roseate spoonbills and wood storks. And, you know, all these species that have kind of come back in Florida, Mm -hmm. we see them on ranches way more than we see them anywhere else. And it's because the cattle ranchers are managing that land. So I think that's an encouraging thing. And I think also, like, the cohesiveness, my wife would tell you the only thing I'm really good at is team building. <laughs> <laughs> um, the the cohesiveness of over the years of doing this, we now have a lot of trust, a lot of relationship with Coastal Conservation Association of Florida, American Sport Fish Association, those guys on the ground in Florida, Congressional Sportsman's Foundation, Delta, Safari Club, uh, National Shooting Sports. We've put together this team that when an issue comes up is willing to say, yeah, we're on this team, Mm -hmm. which has been a thing that's been missing for a long time and has been missing without any real. If Travis forms, my dad ran the the Polk County Beagle Club because he used to run dogs with beagles. Mm -hmm. It was great. That's a great club, but it had like 22 members in it. There wasn't any real power there. Right. There's a power in having Delta Waterfowl and Safari Club and National Shooting Sports lined up next to you. Mm-hmm. For sure. And I don't mean that as reductive to the Polk County Beagle Club. I'm picking on them because they don't even exist anymore. <laughs> but we have a lot of little organizations, you know, friends of Lake Estepoga 
they don't carry the weight to be able to move the needle that sometimes you can get when you build a bigger team. Right. And so if I'm looking at things that are encouraging to me, um, I'm seeing opportunities for partnerships. I'm seeing creativity in how we're going about those partnerships. And we've got some stuff that we're working on um, with the farm bill reauthorization comes up next year. And that's going to enter into uh, money that gets reallocated back out to ranchers. And we've got some things that we're trying to play with in there to increase access for hunters and get ranchers paid through federal subsidies for allowing hunting on their property. Like we've got some creative stuff that we're really working on with some of these organizations that I'm, I'm hopeful, you know, we're not going to win every fight, but at least we're going to suit up for them. That's, that's awesome, man. And a couple of things I wanted to touch on out of what you said. Um, you know, the first thing is we've always felt like, uh, cause Tony and I, we hunt Florida as much as we can, but we also go to states like Arkansas and, you know, other different waterfowl states. And of course our home state of Georgia, but, um, compared to, let's just talk about, I know Georgia's not the same situation as Florida, but, um, you know, I feel like Florida does a really good job. We've always thought of managing some of these, um, you know, opportunities like, uh, you know, you can like a place like TM Goodwin, for example, or Broadmoor, you know, um, or STAs or whatever, they record the number of birds shot, the species. So, you know, even if you only pull that once or twice a year, you know that you're going to have a good chance of shooting three, four five birds per hunter, which I think is really unique. Um, and the other thing I wanted to touch on um, compared to other states is like Arkansas does a similar subsidy thing with um, farmers. We actually pulled a tag last year. Um, and it's basically with the rice field, it's called the W rice program. You may have heard of that, but, um, yep, that's part of the program that we're, we're looking into. Perfect. Yeah. So that's when you said that, that's exactly what I thought about. Cause that is a good part. We've been boots on the ground and seen it and had success in that environment in Arkansas. Yeah. You're spot on, you know, people, people sleep on hunting in Florida. I agree because everyone wants to fish in Florida mm -hmm. and we don't have big deer now mm -hmm. through, through marketing and YouTube channels and everything else, people are going to hunt the Osceola Turkey to extinction. I'm convinced <laughs> because everybody's got to come here to get it. But I, I love it because they are getting out in my woods and seeing my Florida the way I see it. I, mm -hmm. I, I love that. Yeah. But, um, you know, historically, Georgia is a little bit of a flyover state. Like you guys right. kill a ton of wood ducks and on the right day, you can kill a ton of ducks period, mm -hmm. but it's kind of a flyover state. If you look at the, if you look at the map of the United States and you look at the Eastern seaboard mm -hmm. coming from the outer banks, if you draw a line straight down, you come to Merritt Island, Florida. Mm -hmm. And historically, if birds went over open water, that's where they came in. Wow. Like if you went back 50, 60, 70 years, that migration route has always existed. Mm -hmm. So, and then if you go the other way, if you go to the Mississippi flyway, when teal hit the Gulf coast, you know, a lot of our blue winged teal, they believe now come from the prairie pothole region. They come from the, the central flyway, even though we're an Atlantic flyway state. Mm -hmm. So we get birds that come from all over. I would argue I've hunted a lot around the South and central United States. I would argue that those hunts you mentioned, Merritt Island, Goodwin, Broadmoor and the STAs, are among the best public land hunts you can get in the United States. And like they yeah. are, they are, I'm not saying they're the best, but they are among the best. If you like to duck hunt and you like to shoot a variety of birds. I, yeah, you totally hit the nail on the head with that. Cause you know, we go and hunt States like, and I'm sure you've been to other States too, where you have like bird purists, like mallard purists, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. and you know, we tell them, yeah, like our good buddy, that runs an outfitter out in Arkansas. We tell him, you, you know, yeah, next weekend we're going to be down there shooting ring necks and teal with alligators around. And he's like, y'all are crazy. <laughs> yeah. yep. And we're like, yeah, we would love to, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think we should take on a, maybe I should come up with a new shirt that says uh, blue wing teal purist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, because um, you know what? I was just telling somebody the other day, I go, you guys chase those green. I get it, man. They're a beautiful bird, you know, especially when you we connect with a good uh, northern uh, big old thick bird, you know, but you get about two, if you're lucky, four weeks, two week, maybe at the end of the season to shoot a fully plumed blue wing teal mm. and you can't do that anywhere else in the united states i mean very very 
very limited areas you can do that in the United States. But mm-hmm. Florida presents one of the best opportunities in the in the north in North America. For sure. Um, outside of getting out of the United States, you know. So right. Um, and you know, the first time I ever laid eyes on one was a wounded one, and uh, it wasn't something that we'd wound. We actually were coming out of our our spot, and we looked down this down this little hole, and I said. I thought it was a decoy. Mm-hmm. It was so pretty, dude. I mean, I just, I'd never seen a bird look like that. So when I got the opportunity to shoot one during a veteran hunt, mm-hmm. you know, it was like, yo. Ma- Listen, folks, it's a known fact that having motion in your decoy spread is going to increase the likelihood of you having success. Over at Mojo Outdoors, they have a product for every type of environment you're going to hunt in. For example, if we're hunting Florida, we might use a blue wing teal spinner and the coot rippler. If we're hunting in Arkansas, it's probably the king mallard or the spoonie. With that being said, check out Mojo Outdoors. Howard Purist, check this out. You know, yeah. you have, you, yep. I mean, you only get a limited time to be able to get those babies. Yeah, and just to, and Travis, I'm sure you'll have some good input input on this too. But uh, back to why Florida is a slept on hunting state. Like, I think with the opportunity to go on any given hunt and shoot a whistling duck, a mottled, and a blue wing, fully plumed, and late, you know, mid to late January. I think that's a pretty unique opportunity to shoot those birds, you know? Absolutely, man. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't. There's nowhere in the United States that is as consistent with both fulvous and black bellies as Florida is. Mm-hmm. I know Louisiana's getting more of them, and they're going to take over everything in the world. Like, they're just <laughs> such they, – they breed like two or three times a year. They're really, really prolific. Yeah, they, I mean, we'll be, we'll be banding ducks um, – in September before early teal season and black bellies will have chicks like too small to catch and band. Wow. Like, like they'll have at least two clutches a summer and sometimes they'll have three. I mean, they are prolific breeders. You'll see them. Sometimes they'll have 10, 12, 14 babies with them. Um, not dump nested. Like they will hatch just massive clutches. So they, they'll take over everywhere, but they adapt really well to urban settings. Mm -hmm. I, I hate hunting them because they don't work. Right. Like I'll be a little bit of a duck hunting purist here. Like I like being able to, to make a call and make a duck do a thing with the call. Yeah. So I get that from the mallard guys. Like that's really what it's about when you're out in timber or rice field or whatever is, mm-hmm. can I make a, can I make a duck react to a call? Um, and we, you know, obviously we can do that with models, but we can only kill one. Mm-hmm. But the, uh, you know, the, you got the black bellies, you got the full this. There's nowhere in the United States where you're going to consistently kill those outside of really. If anyone's listening to this and they want to come to Florida and hunt them, don't book a guide, get an STA permit. Yeah. I, I promise you, your odds are higher getting an STA permit. It's just that's that's the spot to kill a full whistling duck if you want to kill one. Um, model ducks are easy to kill. They're everywhere. And then, like you guys mentioned, like we have some pretty tricked out stuff when the season when the once it hits january you start to see we call them mohawks on those blue wings uh-huh. where they get that white line that like comes all the way back down their head yeah mm-hmm. and it's they're kind of they get almost like wood ducks where everyone you pick up you're like dang should i get this thing mounted yeah <laughs> and then you're like well i've got three in the freezer already to mount maybe i shouldn't get you know four of them mounted but every one of them it's it's like when you pick up a wood duck like a drake wood duck every one you pick up you're like god this thing looks like it was hand painted yeah yep. that's how those blue wings look man. they they all look like they were hand painted and anyway it's it's special I, I love it more than any place on the planet um you know it, you just you you got to be okay with the suck which I think most duck hunters are okay with that anyway. I mean, how many guys do you know that go out and kill six ducks every day, 69 days? Right. Yeah. Not like very many. not that many. <laughs> so you got to be okay with the suck that you even duck hunt. Florida's hot. There's mosquitoes. There's alligators. There's snakes. There's, you know, <laughs> I've had sharks take ducks out of decoys before. I've had <laughs> manatees get tangled up in my one. lines. Like, <laughs> yeah, we had, a, we had a bunch of bull sharks one time. They were small. They were all like three or four feet. And they would come up and take the ducks that we were shooting. We were shooting divers on the coast. And they would come up and take the ducks out of our decoys. And I was like, oh, my God. Well, like, that makes so- sense because that's a big um, a big area for baby sharks is it up in the mangroves, up in the up the coastal areas. It's exactly right. But it does make you think twice, like, when you walk out there to pick up your duck. <laughs> yeah. Like, have, about to have jaws un, unfurled here, <laughs> Travis. I'm sure you get this question a lot, being that you got a guide service or out, you know, an outfitter service, and 
uh, I, you know, we talked to these guys in the Mississippi Flyway, and they're like, "You are nuts to duck hunt with gators around." And I, I've had gators eat, you know, we've had gators eat our birds. I think pretty much every Florida duck hunter has had that happen. But have you ever had like an ag- a gator get aggressive with you? Because I haven't ever had that happen, you know. So, um, no, I'll say no. I've I've kicked two gators. Both were <laughs> small. Um, yeah, I say small, five six feet. Mm-hmm. but both were small and they were as scared of me as I was of them. Mm-hmm. I had one, I had one public land. Um, it was a myrtle head. It got blown out by hurricane Irma, but it was a myrtle head and there was a hole in it, like where it had gotten blown out and no one would run their boats in there because it was just stupid to do so. Cause it was rough on your boat. And so I sent it in there and I mean, we killed like, two or 300 ducks out of this hole one year. So what we did is we left our, we took dove stools in there and set them under the myrtle trees. And we just left them in there. Like we'd we'd be back in three days. Mm -hmm. And I went in there one morning and there was about an eight footer and he was on top of my dove stool in that hole. (laughs) What? (laughs) Yeah. And I, he got so used to us shooting the hole. Like he, he basically was tamed. Like he would not leave. And that's, I felt bad because I'm like, you don't want to condition a gator to be used to people. Right. Like you want them scared of you. Um, so that was bad. Like we had to move out of that hole for a while. And I, I'm sure he got dispatched during gator season the next year. Mm-hmm. Cause I dropped a pin or three to several guys that had permits. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've had, I've had lakes that I quit hunting because the gators, particularly in early teal when it's hot, mm-hmm you shoot the first time or you set your decoys up and it gets daylight and they're lined up like labs around your decoys. Mm -hmm. Like you'll have, you'll have three to five of them just kind of, you know, in a half circle around your decoys. And so then it's like, Hey, you're not putting a dog in there. I'm not waiting in there. Yeah. Um, but so we are in a boat blind. How am I going to get to that duck before that gator gets it? So you shoot, you know, you shoot six or eight ducks, you, your group does, and you don't get any of them. Well, that feels kind of like, why am I doing this? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, it's fun to shoot, but I'm not, I'm not getting any of the birds back. And really all I'm doing is feeding these gators, which is just training them to continue to eat ducks. Mm-hmm. So um, I've never had one that was like coming after a dog uh, the ranchers i've worked with have had them charge guys on horses before wow but i've never had one and we've had them the, the ranchers have had them take uh cattle dogs they've had they had one gator take a couple of cattle dogs but in those cases you know it's on private land they can get a private land nuisance permit and remove the gator right so when we see one on private land when we see one that gets big enough to be a problem. And this is the thing about gators. Big ones are never that aggressive. Like a, like a 10 foot gator is not going to chase your top water bait when you're fishing mm-hmm. a five or six foot gator is right. Mm-hmm. It, there's something in them like that size. They need to show off. They need to front off a little bit. And so they'll, they'll kind of get after stuff. They'll, they'll show up and chase a dog. A big gator is a smarter hunter. Mm-hmm. like they'll be stealthy about it i'm not saying they wouldn't take your dog or take a kid or take a person if they could but they're way more stealthy about it they're not as aggressive that five six seven footer is the one that'll kind of show out a little bit mm-hmm. and if you get one of those around well if you get one of those around and there's a big bull he's going to take care of him anyway right. like he'll kill him but if you if you get one of those around and we see it we we can get permits or tags and get rid of that gator. It sounds a little bit like uh, just about every species of everything, including humans, you know, <laughs> like that 21, 20 year or 22 year old guy. That's like, you know, all bucked up or maybe that like three and a half year old deer. That's, you know, chasing the doe until the big boy comes around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the bigger ones have access to all the good stuff and I got to get whatever, whatever I can while I can, you know, but uh, you know, Travis, I can't, go without saying this until my, I I gotta say it before my old mind forgets again. (laughs) And that is, you know, we, we uh, inadvertently talked about how black bears applied to a lot of things here. We've been talking about crazy things you see when you're out there hunting. Um, 
waterfowl in the state of Florida. No shit. Tristan and I are in a canoe, public land. We're on this water. Oh yeah. We're we're sitting there, do 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 do, just going along through all these lily pads. It's one of those places that is the duckiest place you ever saw, and you just sit there and pray to Lord on your knees and say, "Why have they not come here?" <laughs> because yeah. all the food is here. It's just why. Well, we're sitting there doing that, and I look up and I start noticing that we're surrounded like the edge of this whole waterway surrounded by um, live oaks. And okay. I'm, I'm looking and I see all these dead branches and it's just real consistent at about 10, 15 feet. And I'm looking at that and I'm going, dude, something is just killing off these li- I mean like a significant amount of trees. And then I see part of a tree moving and then I start looking a little bit closer and I'll go, Okay, there's the source. There's a black bear <laughs> up in the tree right above us, sitting there chowing acorns down. Dude, that's awesome. I'd never seen a black bear. In a, I, of course, I know they go in the trees, but I'd never thought about them feeding in the trees. Mm-hmm. This bear had taken out 200 yards, mm-hmm. probably, in who knows how long, maybe two days. <laughs> I don't know. But it just it got it to a certain height of what the which ones it wanted and just was scarfing them. And uh, I was like, well, you don't see that in Illinois. No. <laughs> <laughs> File that under stuff only duck hunters see. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and and also file that under um, – I have a whole list of places like you described that is full of duck food and no ducks. So if you need any pins that just look pretty, <laughs> they look right, I have – I have literally thousands of mornings spent in places like that. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, let's talk about that since we've been on the subject about duck hunting. I mean, one of the common problems with Florida, at least any Florida duck hunter will tell you, is we got too much water. You know, um, you could argue that. You know, we do have all these great resources, and, and but sometimes there's just too much water, right? Or no? <laughs> Or are we uh, you, just lacking the, 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 the waterfowl? So here's my pro tip, okay? This is my pro tip as a guy that for years only guided on public water. That's, that's legal in Florida. You can guide on public land. Yep. Um, I tell people all the time that are getting into it in Florida, learn what ducks in Florida will eat. So, so you mentioned the mallard guys a minute ago. Like, you know what they're going to eat in flooded timber. You know what they're going to eat in a rice field. Like, you know why they're there. Yep. That's easy to rule out. What's much harder is, um, so there's lily pads. There's, a, there's like, I don't know, 30 varieties of lily pads. There's fragrant water lily, and there's spatter dock, and there's Mexican water lily. And they, they have different blooms, and they have different preferences among ducks as far as a food source goes. Mm-hmm. So there's a time of year in Florida when wood ducks, see, so you know how acorns will switch years? Yep. Like you'll have years where you, where you don't have a good mast with acorns. There's a time of year where wood ducks will switch exclusively to spatter dock in Florida. And eat the So tubers? if you want to, yep. Well, there, there's like a little seed at the base of the flower. Like if you, if you disassembled that, it's like a yellow and red flower. If you disassembled that, there's like little seeds there. Hmm. And I've actually shot wood ducks. You know how you shoot a wood duck and you toss him in the boat and acorns come out of him? Yep. I've shot wood ducks, tossed them in the boat, and those little yellow seeds come out of them. Wow. So there's a time of year where I know that I need to find spatter docks and find spatter dock that's blooming. And you can actually see where the wood ducks are going to feed based off the cutoffs on the flowers in the lily pads. Wow. You can, you, so you, you know that they're in this area, you know that they're using this lake or whatever, but you can, th- there will be a line somewhere on there where you will see that they have eaten those seeds to the point where you know where they're going to be the next morning. Mm. Wow. So I scout hard for food, which is why I have spent plenty of mornings sitting in places where there were no ducks. <laughs> you know, for, for us, it's hydrilla. Yeah. Um, it's cara, which is a macroalgae that kind of looks like hydrilla. It's eelgrass, it's widgeon grass, it's spatter dock, it's acorns if you can find them, it's smartweed, which is a, a native little marshy plant. Um, 
I spend way more time as a botanist roaming around looking for stuff like that and then figuring out how the birds are going to use it. But something else we've learned is, so there's a study, and I'll be wrong, I'm not a scientist, but it's pretty close. There's a study out there that they've looked at the caloric value of hydrilla, and in some cases, hydrilla's cacao value to a duck is greater than corn's. Wow. I, 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 I've, I've actually read that. Um, I think it's a, there's actually a report put out by the University of Florida. Yeah. The, the other side of that is ducks. Like, Do you want coffee that doesn't suck? Get the duck. Dirty Duck Coffee is made specifically for the waterfowl enthusiast. Enjoy flavors like Morning Wood, Dark Dynasty, Cinnamon Teal Snickerdoodle, and First Flight to unlock the flavor that you'll enjoy in the blind for years to come. Our friends at Dirty Duck Coffee Company are now offering all Zero Duck 30 followers a 15% discount when you use code Zero Duck 15 on your next order. When you and I go to McDonald's, we pig out and we're like, oh, this is delicious. I want to eat here again. But we feel kind of empty a little while later because it's really empty calories. Mm -hmm. And when we go to Roos Chris and we eat a 32 ounce porterhouse, we're like, oh my God, that's the best <laughs> protein I've ever eaten in my life. Ducks are really kind of the same way. So if you have this really nutrient-rich lake, you have the plants growing really fast, you may have hydrilla growing really pretty in it that's a lower caloric hydrilla than a smaller patch in a different lake that has a higher calorie. Well, the ducks know and are going to end up concentrating wherever the higher calorie value is. Mm -hmm. Now, I have no idea what to do with that information, but I think that's the reason you will sometimes see a lake that's in our case, a lake that's blanketed out with hydrilla with 200 ducks on it versus another lake that has like four patches of hydrilla with 5,000 ducks on it. Mm. Wow. Interesting. The, the hydrilla on the second lake has a higher caloric value. The ducks have figured it out, and that's where they're going to stay. And so those are the ducks. You hunt them. They fly off. They're coming back because right. they know that that food is a higher caloric value. Huh. Well, one thing, you know, with uh, Waterfowl in Florida that I definitely wanted to ask you because of your experience is, uh, you know, last last season, um, you know, it was you probably know about it. There was a big cold front probably around, I don't know, the second or third week of January, and it was like the coldest push of weather that had been through Miami since 2008, I think. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we hunted TM Goodwin, actually, on that um, that weekend, and we also hunted a spot in Georgia. And so we hit Georgia on Sunday on the way home, but a spot that we know. And then we hit, um, you know, TM Goodwin on Saturday. And uh, the, it was the most stale birds. We thought for sure, you know, it was just going to be a nice, good push because it was the coldest, arguably the best cold front in years. Um, and it did not seem to affect the birds like that. So I wanted to ask you. Do you think Florida is a state where these birds just come and they're here for the year? Or do you think that versus like other states, for example, like Arkansas, when Missouri freezes up, you're going to see an absolute blood bloodbath in Arkansas. Do you think Florida, like, have you seen that happen with cold fronts in Florida? I don't think we get the same type of weather driven birds that we used to get. Mm -hmm. I think so. So a couple of things. One, you've got, all birds are photo period migratory, meaning that there's some dependence on day length. Mm -hmm. Blue wing teal, the second it flew, I mean, we had blue wing teal in our field August 6th last year. Wow. I mean, they just, they, they knew it was coming and they came. Wow. There was no weather pushing blue wing teal from Canada to come to Florida. Like they, they just, that's what they do. Mm -hmm. Um, when you get, I think when you talk about the Midwest birds, you talk about mallards and things, what's going to move birds food safety or sex mm -hmm. right like that's the, that's the big three they're kind of like me like those are <laughs> those are the things that i worry about in life so so they're gonna they're gonna if if there's food and it's not locked up those birds are going to stay as long as they're safe right. you put enough pressure on them if there's food they'll flip to nocturnal mm -hmm. as long as that food's not locked up like we see that a lot in the Midwest, right? That that suddenly your 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 mallards and pintails are using a bean field or whatever, and you put some pressure on them, and then they go nocturnal, they get stale. Mm -hmm. So I think in Florida particularly, 
what we see is a couple of factors. One, I think the way we hold water has changed over the years. So I think we are short stopping, and I hate that word, but I think we are short stopping divers further up the state. If you're familiar with Payne's Prairie, just south of Gainesville, um, that area holds a tremendous amount of water now. And you can drive down Interstate 75 and see a thousand ducks Mm -hmm. from the road and probably 5,000 coots. Those birds stop there. There's no reason for them to move. They've got plenty of food. They've got plenty of water and they've got no, they've got safety. Mm Mm-hmm used to it didn't hold water the same way so those birds ended up in okeechobee those birds ended up in the stas those birds ended up in apopka they ended up in other places so i think what we are seeing is birds get here they'll trade around a little bit but we don't see the weather pushes we don't see the weather pushes whether they always happened or not because we've got other places for the birds to be Right. So I, I, we're never getting birds that are moving here because something's locked up necessarily unless they're jumping over Tennessee, Georgia right. to get here. Like how often is Georgia going to lock up? Right. Yeah, good, good point. Like yeah. you're going to get, you're going to get snow flurries once a year or something. Like it's not going to get that cold for that long to where it forces those birds down, but you don't have as much water as we have in as many places as we have it. So I think the birds, I think the birds get here migratory wise based on photo period. And I think, you know, there is some weather dependency within photo period. Like there's a reason ringnecks don't come on the solstice in September. They come in November Mm -hmm. and it's, it's somewhat weather driven, but I think we've materially changed the way the water works down here. And so add that into the vast majority of birds hunted in Florida are residential birds. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is if you went, if you went down the list of the top, the top six species killed, I would guess you have blue wing ring neck. So those are both migratory species. And then I would guess you have model duck, wood duck, black belly, whistling duck. Mm Mm-hmm. So three of those top five are residential ducks. Yeah. They live here yeah. year round. You go hunt, you go hunt model ducks, which are a dumb duck. <laughs> like they, they will respond to a call. You can shoot at them and you can call them back. Like you shoot, if you shoot the the hen, you can call the drake back every time. Like they're just not that smart. Black belly whistling ducks are not smart ducks. The best decoy for a black belly whistling duck is to shoot one. You can get one on the water. <laughs> You can kill them all. Like they're they're just dumb. But those ducks are still going to be susceptible to pressure. So you look at a spot like Goodwin. Yes, you'll get teal that bounce, you know, back and forth a little bit in the winter. So so again, you look at a front like you're talking about. There may have been teal there that got pushed out by the front, mm-hmm. uh-huh. and they moved a hundred and they moved a hundred miles south. And there were no teals a hundred. There were no teals. There were no teal a hundred miles north to move in. Gotcha. Makes sense. So I think it's more of a trading game than anything else when it comes to Florida ducks at that point in the year with weather. I mean, don't get me wrong. I get caught in the same trap every year. I'm like, oh, dude, this weather. We're gonna we're gonna just be slap loaded with birds. Uh-huh. And then I sit down and think about it. I'm like, where the heck are those birds gonna come from? Like, <laughs> yeah, are they just gonna like tr- transport, teleport here because they weren't here? Like, it's not like they're staged up in Ocala someplace and they're right. gonna <laughs> magically appear in Clueston three days later. Mm-hmm. They're just not coming because I don't know where they're gonna come from. And so when you look at it pragmatically, it kills some of your hopes and dreams, but also. You you also don't know you get a front that comes through and then you get that little warming trend after we've had blue wing teal show back up after we thought they were gone. Yeah. Like and I'm convinced those teal bounced back north. Right, a little reverse per- push going on. Yeah, like why wouldn't they? I mean, it's a bird. You get up you get up 200 feet in the air, you can see a long way. Mm-hmm. Oh, that looks like food over there. Let's go do that. I mean, it's, it's a duck at the end of the day. It's not that smart. 
we're giving it a lot of credit for knowing <laughs> calories and knowing safety and everything else, but it's still a duck at the end of the day. Right. Right. Well, um, you know, Travis, and this wasn't on the outline and it's just came to my mind and I got to know if you know anything about this or if there's any movement going on with this. And that is, you know, we've on a lot of recent podcasts, we've talked to Sean Weaver about South Dakota and how, you know, it, I would call it the good old boy state, you know, where it's still like when I grew up, you went over to somebody and said, Hey, um, can I come help bale hay for the summer an opportunity to be able to, to deer hunt there? Or can I help fix fence or, you know, that kind of thing. And that stuff is still real life up in the North. Um, I tried to take that to Florida and I saw a corporation in my face. Every place I looked or down central to South central Florida is just consumed by corporations that own thousands and thousands and thousands of cropped acres. Um, I've seen birds that some of these cropped acres that border some of these places we've been talking about, you know, we had a great hunt one time because some guy in a, and what do you call those like bicycle plane things that fly through the air? He had like an air fan on the back of yeah. the parachute. Dude, he kept going over on this private land and busting up all these ringnecks. And I'm like, dude, that's the most ringnecks I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. You know, but they were not they were over there, you know. And I'm sitting there looking at that going, God, opportunity for waterfowlers. Is there anything going on, any co-ops uh, with some of these big corporations? Or do you have any suggestions to people on how to get a foot in the door and maybe to some of these places. So I won't say there's not anything going on. I mean, that's similar to what, what we've done with our operation. Um, because we, we have partnered with ranchers to say, Hey, how can we allow some level of hunting access onto these properties. Mm -hmm. So we, we've, we've had some success with that so far. We're hoping we can make that scalable, scalable without over commoditizing it. So there's a couple of problems with what you just described. One is liability. Mm -hmm. You get a big corporation involved and there are some monsters and suddenly you got the liability problem. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, it's way better for them to let some employees hunt or some corporate muckety mucks hunt or no one hunt than it is to allow you or me to give them 500 bucks to hunt a Saturday. Right. Yep. Because the risk is so great. Um, we live in a litigious society. So how do you get past that? I think the way to get past that is you have to be liked, known and trusted. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I don't think the days of cold calling work anymore, particularly in Florida because of the carpet bagging, like mm -hmm. to steal from a, from a, an old term, right. no one's from here. So you knock on a door and you seem like a nice guy, but at the end of the day, everyone's always looking for an angle. Mm -hmm. How are, how are you going to exploit this and make money off of them and make them look bad and put them at risk? So there's a, there's a trust problem there that is not easily fixed without some serious runtime, which is a thing that personally I've been working on for a long time. You know, over the years you hear, if you went into conservation circles, like on the fishery side, it doesn't take long before you start hearing sugar get demonized. U.S. sugar, Florida crystals, man, those are pretty good organizations run by pretty smart people that care about Florida. Yeah, they want to make money off their crops. Guess what they plant? They plant rice as a recharge or a cover crop in between sugar cane planting. Mm -hmm. Guess what's loaded in those rice fields? Right. Blue winged teal and black bellies. Like, so how can we work with some of those those guys? You know, those guys show up and hunt. They they they're standing in line next to you at the STAs. They're they're regular folks and they want to do a good job and they they don't want to damage the environment, but their job is to work this crop. Mm -hmm. Um so I think it's a broader, we have to change kind of our expectations, but also we have to be better at creating community because community is where that liked, known and trusted stuff happens. Sure. Um, I didn't just walk up to a cattle rancher and say, Hey, will you let me duck hunt here? 
we got to know each other over years Mm -hmm. before, you know, I, I started running hunts on his properties. And the other side of all of this, though, is a little bit of our own problem. And I say this as a guy that makes most of my money off hunting ducks. And that is we've commoditized a public resource. Mm-hmm. And ducks are a public resource. We've commoditized it so we can make money off of it. I want to make money, right? Duck season's coming. I'm booking hunts right now. I want to book out my season because that's how I pay my bills. At the same time, how do we... I, I, the average duck hunt in Florida today on private land is going for about 350 to $400. Gotcha. That's excessive. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's outlandish in my mind. Mm -hmm. So we capped our hunts. We capped our hunts at 200 bucks. Now I'm not doing, I'm not doing that judgmentally because we can make up for it on volume. Mm -hmm. Like we can run more hunters. If you can only run 10 hunters and the, the only way you can make the numbers work is to charge $425 a day. Mm -hmm. I get it. Like that's what you got to do. But Heck, man, that's what I paid for shooting flooded timber in Arkansas. Right. That's what I paid for, like, with lodging. Like, so I, I struggle with that because I recognize needing to make money, wanting to make money, the commoditization of this public resource, but also there's got to be a balance in there somewhere that if I isolate it too much, the only people that get to experience this then are the ones that can afford it. Mm-hmm. And that puts a cap on how many people get to experience it, Mm -hmm. which in my mind puts a cap on conservation. It puts a cap on hunter recruitment. It puts a cap on like, if I'm thinking long-term, I'm not going to be around in 50 years, but if I'm thinking 50 years from now, who's going to be running this duck hunting operation, we're dang sure going to need some more clients to hunt. Mm -hmm. Where are they going to come from? If we limit this to only, you know, if I charge 500 bucks a day, I guarantee you I could find 10 guys to pay that every Saturday. Right. Logistically, it makes my life way easier, but it also responsibly is probably not the wisest thing to do from a long-term effects of hunting as conservation in my state. Mm-hmm. So it's just a balance that I kind of look at that through that lens. And again, I'm not condemning anybody that doesn't, but I wish more people did. Because I think there's a responsibility that comes with that that also lends itself to if Matt was on this podcast with me, my rancher, my partner, my buddy, he would tell you how unique it is to see these people that would never come through a gate experiencing his properties. That's pretty cool. He, yeah. he, he's out there. So, you know, I don't have a traditional lease. I have a handshake. Yeah. We don't have anything in writing. And that's how he does business. And that's how I like to do business. And He's out there with me on Saturday morning cooking sausage so that when people get done hunting, they can stand around and talk about cows and deer and panthers and tortoises. And he'll put them in the truck and go cart them around and show them alligators and (laughs) spoonbills. And that's special that we get to do that. And that was a long way, Tony, of saying, I think to solve the problem of how much land we have and how little access we have in in Florida we've got to be creative in building those relationships with those landowners and those corporations and showing them some of the ancillary benefits of having hunters on the landscape, be it revenue stream driven by having hunting concessions, but also the stories that people tell, like there's not a person that came through our operation last year. I'm going to make this number up, but I'll say we had 500 individuals come through our hunts last year. There's not an individual that came through that that's going to go back and say, man, cattle ranching is bad for the state of Florida. Right. Right. That PR campaign is of some value to the ranching community. For sure. I don't know necessarily how to quantify that, but I know that Matt would tell you that's a pretty big deal because he's able to stand out there and talk to these guys day after day after day. And it, it, I think some of those softer things are some of the stuff that we have to convince some of these landowners of in conjunction with revenue streams. Yep. So it's not just not, I'm not saying open your land and let us do this for free, but can we come to some sort of compromise in there somewhere where also, you know, 
sugar, you've been demonized, but if you would allow us to do some wounded warrior hunts out here or some youth hunts out here or some, we're doing a partnership with Delta Waterfowl and University of Florida on their grad students and their hunting ecology program or their ecology, wildlife ecology program, where we're taking them on a hunt on this ranch. That's awesome. If we could do some of those types of things, insurance is easy. We can solve that problem. That's right. a dollar. Right. We can, we can solve that problem. If you'll give us the chance, but you've got to trust us to do it. And so there's a heavy lift. You don't just build that relationship in a day or three. And that's, that's where I think we all get sideways is used to, you build that relationship because you were a nice guy that knocked on my door and wants to shoot my deer. Yep. And I need somebody to mow my back 50 acres. So if you'll run a tractor for a couple of days, I'll let you go take a couple of deer out that trade-off isn't there anymore. We've got to we've got to change the economy of that trade. Makes sense. That's a great. Um, I'm really proud of myself for an- asking this question because <laughs> I, no, I mean it because it's such a drastic difference. You know, in a different part of the world. Yeah. You know, and if you're if you're trying to gain that success. You know, it's something that you're going to have to look at a little bit differently when you come down here to the Sunshine State, Yeah. you know, and uh, I think that's, I think it's, it's a challenge that um, waterfowlers is as addicted as we are. I think we're all up for the challenge and uh, I'm excited to see what people like you and the people, hopefully the people that we can become. Um, to, to, to help support those types of things, because, um, again, it all goes back to the resource, uh, first and then, uh, and then populating that, you know, so, and, um, tra- and Travis with, um, off Florida, I noticed on there that there's a lot of different, um, I, it seemed like probably eight or 10 different, um, options on how people can help, you know, get involved as a member, um, and what would you suggest um, for, you know, some of the um, you can walk people through more, but for some of the memberships, um, you know, it's kind of expected to get involved and be in the state and kind of help with these organizations. But for guys, if somebody's tuning into this from Arkansas or Minnesota or wherever it is and they just want to get in on a membership level, obviously they won't be able to attend much. But um, what would you suggest for those people and then also for in-state people? Well, it's funny you ask that because we did something super different with all Florida. Um, You guys are familiar with spraying lakes because you've had some Florida familiarity. You lived in Florida. Like spraying lakes is the biggest topic really in water quality conservation. Like that's a hot topic in Florida. Man. And so, so used to Travis was pretty anti spray. I would stand up and yell at scientists at me and say, you're killing our lakes, you're nuking our lakes. And then I started to have some conversations and listen to what people were saying to me and determine pretty quickly that they've got a whole lot of science behind what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, That's not to say I want them to go wipe out hydrilla on a lake. Hydrilla is an invasive plant. I recognize that. But it does provide a food value for ducks and a habitat for bass and a nursery habitat for for brim so i finally i saw through our podcast we rallied people to go to these spray meetings about five years ago Mm -hmm. and we ended up with 84 people was the number that went to spray meetings around the state Mm -hmm. and then one day i went to a meeting and stood up and said you know what we were wrong on spraying we want to work with the state like we we still want to have influence but we're not going to say you have to stop spraying because that's crazy. Mm -hmm. So we earned some respect and some trust doing that. But what I learned was there's a lot of people out there that want to engage and they don't know how to. Mm -hmm. It's intimidating to get in your car and drive for an hour and a half and walk into a meeting that's like in a formal courtroom type setting or boardroom type setting. Yeah. And then – you're given two minutes or three minutes with lights on a podium that are going to go off and you're getting cut off if you haven't made your thoughts and you, maybe you're nervous about speaking in front of people anyway, you haven't done it since high school. Like, I mean, that's a pretty common public fear. Yeah. So one of the things that we've always tried to do is equip our people to be informed, to speak from a position of being informed 
about conservation topics in Florida. I'm not going to tell you what you need to think about spraying, but I'm going to tell you a lot about science about it. And I'm going to go show up and I'm going to, I'm going to talk about what I think about, but you can go learn. I'm going to get, I'm going to put the cookies on the bottom shelf, so to speak. So yes, the question about all Florida, one of the things we did that I felt was super disruptive and super creative was we created a $5 participating member. Mm -hmm. And the idea there was I didn't ever want this to be, I'll pick on Ducks Unlimited because I'm a Ducks Unlimited member. I love Ducks Unlimited. I've always been a DU guy. I didn't want it to be where it was only the elites that were able to be a part of this. Mm -hmm. And and being a Ducks Unlimited member, $35 isn't that much money. Right. I think that's what it is now for the base. Yep. But at the same time, I know some people that have hunted with me over the years and scratched and scraped together pennies. Or we did programs. We did a program a few years ago where if you'd never hunted before, um, we would take you hunting for free. That's cool. We did a program a couple of years ago where we would take teachers hunting for free. Wow. That's cool. So if you were a school teacher, we didn't care what you taught. We would take you. And if you didn't want to hunt, if you didn't want a gun, if you didn't want to shoot, we would just take you on an eco tour. Wow. And we ended up taking, and we bought you a duck stamp. So we, we bought 180, 80 some odd duck stamps, gave them away to these teachers, took them out on tours. So the idea was from a membership standpoint, if someone wants to be affiliated with us and be a member for five bucks, they can do it. That's what awesome. we ask is they show up at some kind of meeting once a year. Mm-hmm. Be, doesn't have to be FWC. It could be a county commission. It could be anti-development. It could be, you know, a, a city commission. It could be a water quality thing. Like, there's tons of public hearings all over the state every freaking day. Mm-hmm. Just go to one. You don't have to speak. Just go to one. And then we've given some other criteria, like share social media posts and things like that. Like, we're gonna kind of deputize you guys to help be our our social media um, mm-hmm. force. But the idea there was we wanted it so that if anyone wanted to be part of our organization, five dollars they could be a member. There was no, there was no dollar blockade from it because I've been there before. Where I'm a member of a bunch of organizations now, but I have been there before. Where okay, Delta, Ducks, NWTF, SCI, CCA, like thirty-five bucks times five. That's one hundred sixty-five dollars. That's a it's not insignificant to me some years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and those are all good organizations. So I just wanted people to be able to be on the team if they want. Beyond that, we get it all the regular members, you know, the $35, the $100, the $250. And there's different things you get, um, just like all the other NGOs out there give you stuff. But um, the thing I was most proud of is that we came up with that idea of the participating member so that people could join and be part of our team for a really low lift and and very candidly guys, we're not going to go check and see if they attended a meeting. Mm -hmm. Like that's the honor system. We just wanted to give them the opportunity to say, Hey, yeah, I believe in this thing. And you would be surprised. We've had some stories already behind the scenes of people that reached out and said, I wasn't sure about a sportsman's organization, which you guys aren't, but I joined for $5 because I love that you encourage people to show up at these meetings. And it, like that's that's a win because now you're on my team. Yeah. And if you're on my team, we can have a lot more conversations. If it's just like those programs I'm talking about, if I can get a new hunter, if I can get somebody that's never hunted, if I can get a teacher, if I can get an anti hunter, and we can sit down and have a meal, or we can sit in a boat for a couple hours, probably we're gonna get along just fine. Yeah. Like yeah. there's very few assholes out there in the world. I'm yeah. not saying there's none, but there's very few of them. Yeah. But at the end of the day, if I if I can sit down and have a conversation, like I'm a pretty affable guy, I'm a pretty likable guy, I'm a pretty reasonable guy. I can see your perspectives on you're uncomfortable with killing an animal, or it just makes you sad when you see it. You know the anthropomorphization of 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 wildlife, and we can have some really in depth conversations and go down that road. But we can't do that if we can't get together. Right. And so, how do we get those barriers out of the way to get people on our team? Is really the end of the day, what I'm trying to do, because if we can build a team, we can get some serious stuff done. Yeah. And man, I love everything about what you're doing. Um, you know, I, for me and Tony going to other States and stuff, and it's kind of a thing that we've, we're passionate for is going to different areas to hunt waterfowl and making videos out of it and stuff. And 
Um, just to have so much of my young life. I mean, we moved to Florida when I was going in my sophomore year. So sophomore to last year, I lived in Florida. I'm 20, going on 26 now. And um, just Florida has a big place in my heart as just from a lot of different angles. But um, it's cool to see what you're doing. And, you know, we're going to definitely help, you know, help champ- champion this uh, campaign you're, you're doing. Well, we appreciate it, man. Like I said, it's it's the best we can do right now. Mm-hmm. It's what we it's what we think we can do right now. It's the best we can do right now. We're very serious about it. Mm-hmm. We we haven't. You asked earlier what we've done. You know, as all Florida, I don't know if this is as all Florida. Although I don't know that you differentiate between that and Cast and Blast and Travis and anything else. Right. But we've missed one FWC commission meeting in five years. Wow. Goodness. And that's awesome. The only reason I missed it is I had a client come in from uh, Minnesota to duck hunt and he booked before I knew what the days of the meeting were in December. So mm-hmm. I, I, I canceled for that, but um, I, we, we just, our, our goal is to always show up mm-hmm. and I'm going to show up no matter what, <laughs> but if we can build out an army of people that are willing to show up, willing to be informed, willing to, be part of the broader team, the team that is FWC and DEP and, and uh, Florida department of agriculture. And, you know, if we can play at a broader scale and think bigger picture, think beyond just the pawn on the chessboard or the knight on the chessboard and look at the whole board and think three, four, five, six moves in advance. I think we could really change the future of both conservation in Florida and what hunting looks like in Florida. I love that. And, I do too. And as for people that, um, you know, are not residents and are just, you know, maybe they're a state away or whatever, like we are in Georgia. Um, can you go to these meetings? Like, for example, let's say me and Tony are down there duck hunting and we notice that there's a FWC meeting or whatever um, the, on a Monday after we're duck hunting Sunday. If you're a non-resident, can you attend these meetings and um, have a say on some of this kind of stuff? Or oh, absolutely. But but again, don't just wrap around the axle of attending like FWC meetings. Like there's mm-hmm. water management in Florida is done by water management districts. Like when you guys were in Jacksonville, it was the St. John's Water Management District. Right. That's everything from. The Oklawaha River, they're talking about removing the dam, the tributaries of the St. John's, the Lake Washington, the Weir, the water levels, Fellsmere Farms, like Lake Helen Blaze. Like there's a bunch of stuff in that water management district where they will have uh, public meetings about access, mm-hmm. about hunting, about fishing, about um Are they going to put a boat ramp in? Are they going to open this and turn it into a WMA? Are they going to allow any kind of use on this property? Are they going to put a hiking trail in? Like that kind of stuff happens constantly all year round and happens all over the state. And it's your head has to be on a swivel because there's so much of it. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times I've been like driving to a meeting across the state and someone's like, oh, are you coming to this meeting that's, you know, four and a half hours the other direction on the other (laughs) coast? And it's like, uh yeah i can't be in two places at one time and i think they're both important Uh uh-huh i think they both have value so um until i don't like mobs i say this a lot i think in social media terms we form mobs a lot Mm -hmm. um tony you mentioned that you're military Mm -hmm. i'm a big proponent of armies like an an army the difference between an army and a mob is an army is well trained they're disciplined Mm-hmm. they're they're looking they're looking to leaders not just one leader they're looking to leaders across across whatever their platoons are they and there's a strategy in how an army is deployed and how an army operates very different than a mob that shows up with pitchforks mobs are never successful in the history of the world mm-hmm. you can go you can go through the visigoths to now there's never been a mob that was successful maybe in the moment but not really right mm-hmm. but armies seals the name like like militant like those are very successful and they're very successful because they're well trained they're well informed they're strategic they're systematic they're thoughtful um 
Exactly. It may not always feel like that when it may not always feel like that when you're in the trenches, but you you know exactly what I'm saying, right? Mm-hmm. Like they're they're very tactical about how they go about it. So um, I tend to think we need to build an army, and I don't mean that as confrontational as it sounds. But I definitely look around at some of the stuff that happens in the conservation world, and I'm thinking, I mean, this is very mob-oriented, very reactionary. We need to be way more tactical and strategic about how we're doing this. Well, you know, Travis, and here's something I want to say to every listener out there, no matter where you are. When tell You can't tell me, unless you live up north somewhere in a very very um, low populated areas. If you live in the majority of the United States, I don't care where you are, and you've lived there for just say five years or 10 years, you have watched resources deplete at a rapid level. You know you have. You might not want to admit it, but if you look back and think about it, I've lived in three different states in my life for, for a significant period. And... Florida, y'all, is getting bulldozed by the minute. And I really believe that the strongest push to keeping the bulldozing is the tree market. (laughs) But it's still, money is outweighing that. And, you know, we saw it in St. John's County where, I mean, you know what I'm talking about, Travis. I mean, just thousands and thousands of acres. Might not have been waterfowl acres, but it was acres where... Your gopher tortoises, your deer, your coons, your the very rare um, um, black um, um, black squirrel, the fox black squirrel. the black fox squirrel. You know these animals. There's no more, mm-hmm. bro. I mean, I love that I lived in a, an HOA, and they were like, "Oh, we well, live on this little nature reserve. nature preserve." I'm like. Great, four squirrels and a copperhead can live here. You know, I mean, it's 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 going rapidly, and you know, Ramsey talked about it too, and yeah. it's everywhere we live, y'all, and we got to do something about it. I mean, we just do, and whether it's us connecting more duck hunters with deer hunters and deer hunters with cattle ranchers and and horse ranchers and. You know, us all getting together, I know that's one thing that's a common thing, um, and I just know this from Mario, um, talking about the relationships that we have with the cattle ranchers in Florida. It's a big, big deal when it comes to us, DU, the hunters, all that stuff. Um, We got to, like Travis was saying, form those relationships. Um, You know what, Tony, as you're talking about this too, like you got listeners all around the country. We've been talking heavily about Florida. I say this all the time. Conservation in Florida, I say two things a lot. One, this is where the big leagues are. Because of those pressures with 21 and a half million people. So we're the third most populous state in the 22nd largest state. So the the two that have more people are like the second or yeah. Texas is second and California's third largest, mm-hmm. maybe fourth, something like that. They're much bigger in land than we are. Um, we have the same population as if you combined North Dakota, South Dakota, Idaho, Montana, Washington, Oregon, and Colorado. Wow. That's perspective. You can combine all those states' populations together and you have our population wow. in one state that is smaller than any of those states except the two Dakotas. That's um, crazy. It is, it is insane when you think about that. So I say this all the time and I don't mean it arrogantly, but I say like, this is conservation of the big leagues. Like I love the guys from Bozeman, the meat eaters and the, and the, the groups like that. But at the end of the day, dude, you're in a state with a million people. I got a million people in my County. Right. Yeah. And, and you're in a state with a million people. That's the second or third largest state. And 250,000 of them, 25% of them have hunting licenses and probably another 10% are married to people with hunting licenses, Mm -hmm. but it's a pretty pro hunting state. And I hear you guys talk, not you guys, but those guys talk about growth, what we're seeing growth wise in Montana. And I'm saying, dude, y'all don't even understand what you're talking about. Yeah. Florida is the model for what you're discussing. So if you want to see how this song ends, Mm -hmm. you can look at Florida. Yeah. And I'm not done. I'm not done. I'm not giving up. 
look at Tennessee, the mm. growth that Tennessee has experienced in the last since COVID. Mm. You know, as people are moving, there's no state income tax there. It's it's very similar to Florida. It's got a good climate. It's got good schools. It's got um, it's got good metropolitan areas like like Nashville and Knoxville. And people are flocking to Tennessee at an alarming rate. Tennessee is going to be like Florida. Like yeah. we're going to see a shift away from consumptive use to mutualistic use use as a public view, even though we're going to have elected officials that were the same elected officials we had when we had a lot of hunters. Mm-hmm. And we're not going to understand what happened. Mm-hmm. And hunters aren't going to have the same relevancy on the landscape that they once had if we're not careful. Right. And I would beseech your listeners to pay attention to what's happening in Florida. Like this stuff we're talking about, sometimes it may get boring. We get in the weeds on numbers and things. But at the end of the day, it's coming to your state. They're not building any more real estate. Yeah. And the southeastern United States is growing. Montana, the Pacific Northwest, that stuff's blowing up as you see the migration out of California into Idaho and Montana. Like you guys need to open your eyes and look at Florida because what we've seen happen here is coming to a theater near you. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I'll just bring up this one um, public area. I want to talk about a, a one that hit home with me. Um, you know, it very well used to be one of the most sought after areas in the state of Florida for public land. And that's Guana River. Yep. Sorry, Florida hunters. We're going to talk about it because if we don't, we're not going to have it. And I just had to bring this up, Travis. So a couple of years ago, um, they were trying to take the Northern end of that. Um, yep. and, for development. Yep. For development. And it's already folks, a place that used to be a class a waterfowl spot that has already got decks at your back in some areas of that place when you're hunting. So you're already seeing houses, you're already hunting where you're hearing the waves crash. Um, that when I saw that happen, like right almost underneath my feet, that was an alarm to me. You know, and it made me just kind of go, gosh, damn, I got to do something about this. Because, you know, if you if you wait until it's too late, it's going to be too late. Yep. If we wait for somebody else to do it, it's going to be too late. We were talking about like, Guana, how that almost how yeah. all that hap- almost happened, you know. Yeah. And it, it only didn't happen because there was a I want to say there was a three year hold placed on the development. And if the state doesn't acquire that land or the feds don't acquire, if somebody doesn't acquire that land, I would guess it's still going to happen. Yeah. I would guess it's still going to get developed on that North end when that prop plus the property value has just gone through the roof in the three years. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And unless we show up in mass and stand up and put our foot down and again, not to get too political, but we say this all the time. Don't New York my Florida. Like we don't want people moving here and voting like they did other states. But at the end of the day, like all of our pro growth policies come from Republicans. Mm -hmm. Like we, we tend to give them a pass because they're not the ones that are like, they're in a dog fight for an election. But at the end of the day, I'm kind of like over giving a pass for both sides of this conversation because frankly, they're the ones that are interested in developing every inch of my state as much as anybody else is. And I'm not anti-growth, but I am responsible growth. I'm pro responsible growth. Mm -hmm. And it seems like we have just checked that at the door and sailed on past it. And I get myself in trouble politically a lot with this stuff, but at the end of the day, I'm just kind of over it because I look around and I'm like, I don't know who to vote for because this guy over here is pro guns, but he's going to bulldoze every square inch of the state. Mm -hmm. This guy over here is anti guns and is also going to bulldoze every square inch of the state. So I'm just, I guess it comes down to guns yeah. <laughs> or, 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 you know, education or whatever your other issue is. But it's very frustrating to me as a conservation guy um, because I don't know who's coming over that hill. And that's that's something we work really hard on behind the scenes is trying to develop relationships with some of these politicians and elected officials so that we can have some influence to, if not stop it, slow it down have some considerations given, have some strategy to it. Um, sure. You know, pu- push, push a little bit in our direction. Yep. For sure. Well, man, I, I would love to sit here and just keep 
keep talking all night, Travis. But man, I uh, we want to be respectful here. Uh, you know your time, man, and it's been a wealth of knowledge for us, and I think a lot of our listen listeners too, just because. Um, you know, a lot of people that listen are probably from Florida, but you know, we hunt in a lot of different States, like, you know, we were talking about earlier. So I think it's been a good thing for everybody that listens to this to kind of have some knowledge on what's going down in Florida. So, well, I appreciate you guys having me. Thank you so much. I, I like I said, enjoy the show. Um, looking forward to listening. I appreciate it so Thank much. You. Man. And, and keep up, keep, keep doing what you're doing. Um, um, yeah, just keep doing what you're doing, man. It's humbling, and uh, I appreciate it so much. And and I'm definitely committed myself to to doing more. Um, you know, that's just part of being an older guy, I guess. You know, but <laughs> but uh, it's it's definitely I'm excited about it. Well, I appreciate you guys. Thank y'all so much. Yes, sir. Have a good night. Southbound, I've been hellbound, riding on the midnight train. Too fast now, think I'll slow down, standing in the pouring rain.